Peptic ulcer is defined as loss of continuity of the mucosal membrane of the gut, usually the stomach or duodenum, due to loss of the mucosal barrier to acid and bile, or weakness in the natural defense mechanism. Peptic ulcer could be acute or chronic, gastric or duodenal, but can occur less commonly elsewhere. The body secretes HCL, pepsinogen, mucus, and intrinsic factor. The antrum secretes mucus and the hormone gastrine. Truncal vagotomy is a common procedure in operations for the treatment of intractable peptic ulcers in order to decrease acid secretion and so allows for healing of the ulcer. However, it also causes delayed gastric emptying and vagal denervation of other viscera like the gallbladder increases gallbladder stone formation. There are three variants of peptic ulceration. Acute erosive gastritis, duodenitis or gastrodudenitis, where there are multiple erosions in the mucosa of the stomach and duodenum. Stress ulcers are types of acute peptic ulceration and include curling ulcer which is stress ulceration that occurs in patients with major burns and Cushing ulcers, which are stress ulcerations occurring in patients with head injury. The second variant is chronic gastric ulcer, which is a disease most common in men, elderly and lower socioeconomic class. It is less common than chronic duodenal ulcers. And the third and most prevalent variant is chronic duodenal ulcer, which occurs in the first part of duodenum in most cases. With gastrinoma, ulceration may involve the other parts of the duodenum as well. There are three main causes for acute erosive gastroduodenitis. The most common is medication especially with aspirin or other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug and with corticosteroids, but the list is long. The occurrence does not always depend on prolonged use, but some patients develop severe gastric erosions from first or second dose of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that they might have been using previously with no complication. Alcohol in particular, as well as too much coffee or other drinks might induce acute erosions. Stress ulcers have already been mentioned and their incidence was found to be reduced by proton pump inhibitors, also known as PPI, which are usually given to the severely ill for this reason. Clinical presentation is by acute pain and tenderness in the epigastric region. Nausea and vomiting can be present. Hematemesis can occur and be massive. Diagnosis is confirmed by upper endoscopy. The treatment includes stopping the offending drug or agent, avoiding spices, fat, coffee, and any irritating food. In severe cases, oral feeding can be stopped for a few days and IV fluids are started. Antacids, H2 blockers, or proton pump inhibitors usually result in prompt healing. Blood transfusion is needed in case of hematemesis. Total gastrectomy is rarely indicated in life-threatening hematemesis that is not controlled by medical treatment. Medical treatment is continued for four to six weeks after the acute attack. The treatment of stress ulcers is the same as the treatment of acute gastritis. The underlying problem, like sepsis, should be corrected. Damage to the gastric mucosal barrier appears to be the most important factor for the development of chronic gastric peptic ulcer 
which can be secondary to any of these listed causes. Malignancy should be considered in all ulcers of the stomach, no matter how small they are or innocent looking during endoscopy. Eight biopsies should be taken from the edge of the ulcer. Follow-up endoscopy is repeated after treatment of benign ulcers and if still not healed, rebiopsy is indicated. Mucosal biopsy near the pylorus is taken for Helicobacter pylori low test in case of prepyloric ulcers. Extensive gastrojudinal multiple ulcerations resistant to healing should raise the suspicion of zollinger ellison syndrome and serum gastrin should be measured. Gastric peptic ulcers are classified according to their location into five types. The clinical picture and diagnosis is mainly burning epigastric pain immediately following meals, epigastric tenderness at examination, and because of the pain induced by food, the patient is afraid to eat and loses weight. The diagnosis is established by upper endoscopy. It detects the ulcer, allows for multiple biopsies to rule out cancer, and allows for biopsies to examine for Helicobacter pylori. Barium meal can show barium in an ulcer crater or ulcer niche, but is seldom used nowadays. Other investigations such as CT abdomen and endoscopic ultrasound are mainly used to exclude cancer. Medical treatment is used initially. Most ulcers will heal in 8 to 12 weeks. This includes elimination of irritants to the gastric mucosa like ethanol, tobacco and other drugs, eradication of H. pylori if present by triple therapy which includes amoxicillin or clarithromycin, omeprazole or other PPI and metronidazole and anti-ulcer treatment by PPIs for the first three months, then H2 blockers. Surgical treatment is indicated in three situations, intractability, complication, or if malignancy cannot be ruled out. Intractability is considered if the ulcer fails to heal after three months of medical therapy or recurs within a year despite adequate therapy. Complications are bleeding not controlled by non-surgical means, perforation, and gastric outlet obstruction. When malignancy cannot be excluded in case of non-healing gastric ulcer despite repeated biopsies, surgery is indicated. Surgical treatment of suspicious malignant gastric ulcer includes distal gastrectomy that should include excision of the ulcer with reconstruction by gastrojejunal anastomosis, whether simple loop known as Bill Roth II gastrectomy or by Roux and Y gastrojejunostomy. Vagotomy is added to antrectomy when there is associated duodenal ulcer with expected hyperacidity. For definite benign peptic ulcers, the operations are discussed later. Almost all duodenal ulcers are associated with acid hypersecretion. In addition, H. pylori infection is commonly present. Less commonly, inappropriate gastrin secretion from gastrinoma, also known as zollinger ellison syndrome, is the cause. Usually the ulcer occurs in the first inch of the first part of the duodenum. The pathology is similar to gastric ulcer, but cicatrization gives rise to gastric outlet obstruction. Anterior wall ulcer may perforate into the general peritoneal cavity, while posterior wall ulcer may penetrate into the pancreas 
may erode blood vessels of the wall causing bleeding or may erode the gastrojudinal artery posterior to the judenum with massive hematemesis. Anterior wall and posterior wall ulcers may coexist and are described as kissing ulcers. The disease is common in males and in blood group O positive. It is a disease of stressful life. The characteristic presentation is severe epigastric pain that is present when the stomach is empty and by night. That is why we call it hunger pain. Consequently, the patient's appetite is good and there is gain in weight. There is periodicity with seasonal variation in symptoms that may disappear for weeks or months to return again. Water brash, heartburn, vomiting may be present. Occult blood in stools, melina and hematemesis can also occur. It may be due to gastrinoma, also called Zollinger ellison syndrome. 70% to 90% of gastrinomas are present in a triangular area called gastrinoma triangle. The first angle of this triangle is the point of junction of the second and third parts of the duodenum. The second angle at the junction of the cystic duct and common bile duct and the third angle at the pancreatic neck. The medical treatment of a peptic duodenal ulcer is similar to the medical treatment of a gastric peptic ulcer. Surgical treatment is indicated in the following situations. First is failure to respond to medical therapy. And second is the development of complications, namely perforation, bleeding, or gastric outlet obstruction. Malignancy of a duodenal ulcer, unlike with gastric ulcer, is extremely rare. Operations for peptic ulcers will be discussed later. This slide summarizes the differences of peptic ulcers of the stomach and of the duodenum. Although peptic ulcers are most common in the duodenum and stomach in that sequence, yet peptic ulcers can occur in other sites of the gut as well. A peptic ulcer of ectopic gastric mucosa in a congenital Meckel's diverticulum might cause obscure abdominal pain and usually is first diagnosed at operation after being complicated with bleeding, which is usually massive, or with perforation and peritonitis. It must be looked for during exploration for peritonitis in association with pneumoperitoneum if the duodenum and appendix are normal. Anastomosis of the jejunum to the stomach may result in a stomal ulcer, especially with no or incomplete vagotomy. This ulcer is subject to all the complications of the usual peptic ulcers. Severe gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD in association with hyperacidity can result in esophageal peptic ulcers, and those patients need fundoplication. Peptic ulcer of the second part of duodenum should raise the suspicion of gastrinoma, which should be excised surgically. The diagnostic investigation for a patient with clinically suspected peptic ulcer disease is upper endoscopy. Contrast radiology does not have a place anymore for establishing a diagnosis. They might be used for further assessment like in case of gastric outlet obstruction. This is because of the unique values stated in this slide for upper endoscopy compared to radiology. Other investigations are for differential diagnosis and when upper endoscopic findings do not account for the symptoms. All patients with acute epigastric pain of few hours should be suspected to have myocardial ischemia 
until the diagnosis is ruled out. This possibility is increased with older age in association with hypertension or hypotension and or arrhythmias. ECG and cardiac enzymes should be done, cardiology consultation in presence of any changes, and usually an echocardiogram is done in such conditions. Other investigations are done to rule out several diseases which present with epigastric pain as shown. As mentioned before, operative treatment is reserved for intractable cases or for complications. Peptic ulcers who do not heal with medical treatment are now rare, especially after the era of PPI, which bring down acid secretion to almost zero and with the effective anti-helicobacter treatment. Therefore, an unhealing duodenal ulcer for three months should raise the suspicion of a gastrinoma and an unhealing gastric ulcer should raise the suspicion of malignancy provided full medical treatment was taken regularly by the patient. If the peptic nature of the ulcer is then confirmed, operative treatment is indicated. There are three types of operations, each with advantages and disadvantages. The most commonly done is truncal vagotomy, where both the anterior and posterior vagi are divided as they pass through the esophageal hiatus. The whole viscera are therefore vagotomized. Unless a drainage procedure is added, there will be delayed gastric emptying, and so either a gastrojejunostomy is done or a pyloroplasty to destroy the pyloric sphincter and to keep it open. Ulcer recurrence or a stomal ulcer might occur. So the second operation was done where the gastric antrum was removed in addition to vagotomy. The antrum secretes gastrin, so this operation has the lowest recurrence rate because of the dual effect of vagotomy and gastrin elimination. The proximal stump of the stomach is anastomosed to the jejunum. The third operation is the super selective vagotomy, where only the nerve fibers of the stomach are divided down to the pyloric canal. The nerve fibers supplying the pylorus are spared. The rest of the viscera do not lose their vagal nerve supply, and therefore the alternative name of parietal cell vagotomy, but it has the highest recurrence rate. This diagram demonstrates the different types of vagotomy. This diagram demonstrates the two types of gastric drainage procedures. Truncal vagotomy with pyloroplasty. Truncal vagotomy with gastrojejunostomy. Perforation occurs much more common with duodenal peptic ulcers than with gastric peptic ulcers because of the thicker wall of the stomach. There is acute severe sudden epigastric pain as if something burst inside the abdomen. This is followed by partial relief after one or two hours due to peritoneal fluid dilution of the acid spillage. Soon the pain recurs in the form of tearing and cutting all over the abdomen due to septic peritonitis. The full-blown picture of secondary bacterial peritonitis will be present at examination with limited abdominal movement with respiration. The patient is lying still because any movement exaggerates the pain. Board-like rigidity and intolerance to percussion. Fever and toxemia may be present if neglected. The aforementioned picture, together with air under the diaphragm in plain X-ray, chest or abdomen, is diagnostic, and no further investigations are needed for the diagnosis. Perforations of few hours may not show pneumoperitoneum in X-ray, and X-ray needs to be repeated after six hours. In this case, other differential diagnoses are to be considered, especially acute pancreatitis, dissecting aortic aneurysm, and acute cholecystitis. 
Abdominal ultrasonography can detect pneumoperitoneum sometimes earlier than plain X-rays. Ultrasonography will also demonstrate intraperitoneal fluid collection. IV fluids, analgesics, PPI, and antibiotics are started, and the patient is prepared for exploration within two to four hours. During that time, the patient is investigated for comorbidities and any is optimized, as well as correction of any fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Surgery is in the form of emergency laparotomy through upper midline incision. All infected fluid is sucked out and sample taken for bacterial culture. Perforation is identified and closed with omental patch, a procedure called Rose-Graham operation. Because of its adhesion property, the omentum seals the perforation and promotes healing effectively. Suction of peritoneal collection, then irrigation and suction with normal saline, something called peritoneal toilet, is done. Drains are placed and the, the abdomen is closed. Vagotomy with gastrojejunostomy as definitive treatment for the ulcer can be done in the stage of chemical peritonitis, but is rarely done now in the emergency setting except if the patient has been already on PPI treatment. Anti-ulcer treatment is used and upper endoscopy must be done after 12 weeks. In perforated gastric ulcer, Biopsies should be taken to exclude malignancy. Distal gastrectomy, including ulcer area, is a better option if the patient's general condition is favorable, as mentioned before. Mortality in bleeding peptic ulcer is high and amounts to 20 to 30 percent. This increases in the elderly, in the presence of comorbidities, and if the patient needs more than five units of blood transfusion during hospital stay. Bleeding can occur from the small vessels in the wall of the ulcer crater or due to erosion into a major vessel such as the gastrojudinal artery in posterior judinal ulcer. Bleeding from erosions of gastrojudinal artery is severe torrential and almost always needs early surgical intervention. Erosion of the splenic artery by a posterior gastric ulcer is almost always fatal. The clinical presentation is hematemesis and or melina with hypovolemic shock in the form of pallor, tachycardia, sweating, hypotension, tachypnea, dry tongue and cold periphery. The patient should be resuscitated blood samples taken for blood grouping and cross-matching, and for estimation of serum electrolytes, blood urea, serum creatinine, and platelet count. The patient is prepared for upper endoscopy, which is to be done once the patient is stabilized. The bleeding that is unlikely to be controlled by endoscopic measures includes presence of spurting vessel, fresh clot covering the ulcer crater, visible vessel, vessel with pseudoaneurysm. 70% of patients with bleeding duodenal ulcers are treated conservatively by correction of shock. The stomach is washed using 1 to 200,000 adrenaline in cold saline through a nasogastric tube, and IV PPI are given 8 hourly. Endoscopy is done in all patients except the exsanguinating patient who must be operated on immediately. Endoscopic management includes cauterization using bipolar cautery, laser or heated probe, vessel clipping using hemoclips, or submucous injection of epinephrine in saline around the ulcer. Surgical intervention is usually needed to control massive hemorrhage defined as patient shocked on admission, hemodynamically unstable patients despite resuscitation, 
continued blood loss requiring more than six units of transfusion in 24 hour period, re bleeding after endoscopic control, or presence of ominous signs on endoscopy, which were just mentioned. The principles of surgery include control of the bleeding vessel by oversewing the bleeding point and ligation of the main feeding vessel, for example, the gastrojudinal artery, if oversewing fails to control the bleeding. Rarely definitive surgery to treat the ulcer can be done because the general condition of the patient is usually bad. Clinical features of gastric outlet obstruction is mainly pain, which is persistent in the epigastric region, and also with feeling of fullness. The pain is associated with copious vomiting, characteristically at the end of the day, which contains undigested food and it is non-bilious. There is nausea and loss of appetite. Positive succussion splash at examination and in severe cases, the patient is confused because of alkalosis and electrolyte changes. Upper endoscopy is needed in all cases to rule out carcinoma. Barium meal shows the stomach to be dilated where the greater curvature is below the level of the iliac crest. Barium will not pass into the duodenum. Blood gases and electrolytes should be surveyed and imbalances corrected. ECG is done to check for changes due to hypokalemia. Surgery is indicated in all cases. Preoperative preparation includes correction of dehydration and electrolyte deficiencies by normal saline 0.9% and glucose 5% usually in a ratio of 1 to 1, and the potassium chloride according to the deficit. Parenteral nutrition is started if indicated. Nasogastric suction is needed for several days with stomach wash using normal saline to decompress and clean the stomach. The stomach is usually hugely dilated and hypoperistaltic. Therefore, Distal gastrectomy is usually needed. Restoration of continuity is through anastomosing the remaining upper half of the stomach to a jejunal loop, an operation known as Bill Roth II. To avoid biliary gastritis and other complications after this operation, a roux en y anastomosis is done instead of the simple loop anastomosis. This distal gastrectomy with Rho and Y anastomosis gives the best long-term results and is preferred nowadays by most surgeons. If the stomach is still not much dilated and retains good peristalsis, vagotomy and drainage procedure in the form of gastrojejunostomy could be done without distal gastrectomy. There are several complications of a gastrojejunostomy, whether with or without distal gastrectomy. These are alkaline reflux gastritis, which is the most common problem after Billroth II, occurring in 25% of all patients. There is postprandial epigastric pain, nausea, vomiting, and weight loss. The diagnosis is made by endoscopy, which demonstrates the gastritis and a free reflux of bile into the stomach. The treatment is conversion of the Billroth II gastrectomy to a Roux en Y anastomosis. Afferent loop syndrome is caused by intermittent mechanical obstruction of an unusual long afferent loop after Billroth II. Symptoms include early postprandial distension, pain and nausea, which are relieved by vomiting of bilious material not mixed with food. The treatment is good drainage of the efferent loop by converting the loop gastrojejunostomy of Berroth II to a Roux en Y anastomosis. Dumping syndrome is caused by rapid emptying of nutrients into the small bowel. It affects most patients, 
but is a significant problem in only a few. There are two types. The first type is called early dumping syndrome, which is the more common. It occurs within 20 to 30 minutes following a meal and is more common after partial gastrectomy with bilirroth to reconstruction. It results from the rapid movement of a hypertonic food bolus into the small intestine. Symptoms are due to rapid fluid shifts into the bowel, causing distension and a subsequent autonomic response along with the release of several hormonal agents responsible for GIT symptoms such as nausea, bloating, abdominal cramps, and explosive diarrhea. The second type is the late dumping syndrome, which occurs two to three hours after a meal and is far less common, causing mostly vasomotor symptoms. The large carbohydrate load passed quickly into the small intestine causes overt release of insulin, resulting in profound hypoglycemia. The treatment of both types is conservative in most cases, but may be surgical if conservative measures fail. Conservative non-surgical me measures include change of dietary habits, avoidance of a high carbohydrate diet, and not to drink fluids with meals. Octreotide is sometimes used. Surgical treatment aims to delay gastric emptying and includes interposition of an antiperistaltic jejunal loop between the stomach and small bowel or conversion to a long limb Rho and Y reconstruction. Post-vagotomy diarrhea is another common complication of gastrojejunostomy. It is mild in most cases, but sometimes it is a disabling problem. Symptoms usually improve during the first year after surgery. This and the following slides demonstrate the different types of operations for gastric outlet obstruction.